Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Rusberg. I am the chief meteorologist uh, working at USDA's Office of the Chief Economist. And I've been invited to uh, talk to you today about the use of weather information in producing the World Ag Supply and Demand Estimates Report. Not, um, it's not common knowledge uh, that there are a group of meteorologists actually working at the USDA just to in, inform, uh, you know, the weather intelligence used in producing the report and looking at the, uh, you know, the yield estimates, the production potential uh, in any given year for some of the major uh, commodity producers. And I want to take a minute uh, to show you how that how that uh, is done, how we go about it, the type of information that we consider. But first, I wanted to give you a little history of why we actually uh, do exist. Now, for those of you familiar with the WASI report, this is the front cover of one that we released earlier uh, this year. And I've uh, zoomed in on a segment which is pretty typical for any given month. Uh, we'll highlight some of the uh, you know big changes that were made. And if weather was an impact, we will highlight that as well. In, in this instance, uh, we talk about Canada and the drought that they had in the prairies this year um, after, you know, we, we, we were very uh, hopeful that, uh, you know, conditions would turn around in, in Canada, but they never did. And also, uh, you know, one of the big areas uh, for many reasons is Ukraine. Uh, and this is talking about how, uh, you know, we're making changes in the yield estimates. So really uh, one of the big components in uh, some of the final decisions made in some of these areas, uh, Canada, former Soviet Union, South America, et cetera, is our knowledge of the weather and climate uh, situation going on at that time. Now, a lot of people have heard of uh, what we refer to as the great grain robbery. And in a nutshell, there was uh, a drought in the former Soviet Union in the 1970s, and they uh, quite quietly made uh, many small purchases uh, in our grain supplies. Uh, and they basically, it was a robbery. They, they got a lot of grain for uh, what was an unfairly low price. And as a result of their drought, uh, they basically bought grain from us relatively expensive inexpensive. And then we and other countries like Australia and Canada suffered the economic impacts from that for years to come. And here's a paper I'm often asked if there's any documentation. This is one of the seminal reports from the time. And it quotes Henry Kissinger, who was our national security advisor at the time. But also, you know, if you remember the 70s, uh, he was pretty much a household name. And he talked about our intelligence about the Soviet Union, about how it was appalling, and our knowledge of, you know, we weren't doing a good job following grain purposes. But one of the one of the key elements that were sort of glazed over in discussions like this was why didn't we know that there was a drought in the Soviet Union that may have uh, you know, eventually led them to seek grain, uh, especially from us. So the, the drought going under the radar, if you will, was really the cause of, of this uh, confusion. And at the time, uh, a lot of people said, well, we had no idea that there was a drought, but some people did. Uh, we had, I, as a matter of fact, the, the several folks that I've worked with over the years at both the National Weather Service and NASA and said, yeah, we knew uh, we could see problems with the satellite imagery, but you know, we we you know weren't working with USDA at the time. So the information was there, but we were we just weren't uh, in a position to capitalize on that information. 
Now that incident, and uh, actually there was there was another uh, incident several years later, very similar. That led to the development of USDA's uh, economic information system, and the this charts, you know, it, it it has a lot of names on it. Basically, the yellow blocks are the agencies involved, and you know, the World Agriculture Outlook Board is at the center. You know, Office of Chief Economist, uh, you know, we're responsible for signing these reports. But you see, Foreign Ag Service Economic Research Service, uh, NAS, et cetera. But you also see the Joint Agricultural Weather Facility. All right. So that is a component. It's not a standalone uh, agency like FAS or FSA, but it is a recognized cog in this machinery. Uh, you see the Weekly Weather and Crop Bulletin is one of the products, and you see that we have a partnership with NAS on producing that. So this uh, unit in USDA is uh, an official part of USDA's economic system. Now, the hierarchy of the world board uh, looks like this. And, and again, this is just underscoring uh, you know, where we fit into the uh, OCE WAOB puzzle. I'm the chief meteorologist, but I'm one of five uh, meteorologists on staff that monitor the weather globally. I have some other duties, but I'll, I'll talk about my uh, responsibilities in terms of the WASD today. Um, and effectively, we have uh, one uh, meteorologist who dedicates his time to monitoring, uh, you know, U.S. weather and, uh, you know, uh, you know, associated, associated impacts from things like drought and flooding. That's my colleague, Brad Rippey, who I, I see is also on today. But there's also four of us who look at global agriculture. Um, we have uh, experts devoted to Asia, uh, Europe, and the former Soviet Union. My you know, part of the world includes South America, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. So you've got this group of meteorologists who are focused on monitoring global weather on behalf of producing the WASD. And Joint Agricultural Weather Service, uh, or excuse me, Joint Agricultural Weather Facility is a bit of a misnomer now. And I'll show you why in, uh, here. When we were first formed in the late 70s in response to the Great Grain Robbery, uh, USDA entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Commerce. Now, some of the subsidiary uh, agreements over the years have included working with NOAA on drought and working with our risk management agency to get them information. But the Joint Agricultural Weather Facility was formed, um, you know, back in the late 70s. And it really, things really started to gel for us in the, in the 80s. And the reason I say that facility is a misnomer now is that we really aren't a facility any longer. Back uh, when we all started, there was actually a staff of meteorologists who worked for the National Weather Service. They were assigned at the USDA building. And when I first started working here, I was one of those, uh, I was a, uh, basically a student employee for the National Weather Service. And I worked side by side with uh, contemporaries, you know, counterparts at USDA. Uh, there were as many as 10 meteorologists here at one time, some working for the National Weather Service, some working for the Department of Agriculture. Now, over the years, that's changed. Uh, the advent of the internet and other advances in computer capabilities uh, allowed for us to be more of a, um, Sort of, well, I, I forget the term. We had a term that we coined for that. Basically, uh, we work with our partners in NOAA remotely. Uh, you know, think of what we did during COVID uh, a decade earlier, being able to communicate and get our products, not just for the weekly weather and crop bulletin, which I'll, I'll talk about also in a moment, but also for uh, informing the WASDI. 
part of that agreement, probably one of the uh, most important things in terms of what we do with the WASD is the data that we receive from Climate Prediction Center. They are now the uh, facility in National Weather Service that we have our partnership with, you know, for the WASD. Originally, it was the Climate Analysis Center and Everybody seems like uh, you can't go 10 or 15 years without changing your name. So uh, it's th basically the same core unit. But, um, you know, we, we do get other products from them. I'm going to start with the global data. This is um, just a snapshot of the information that we get on any given day from the Climate Prediction Center, uh, anywhere between maybe seven or 8,000 stations will report things like weather and uh, well things like weather you know temperature maximum temperature precipitation um, information about the uh, types of weather that they're seeing etc and we get those every day and this looks like really good coverage and we're very grateful this this data uh, set is really the backbone of our analytical uh, you know, capabilities here at the World Board, but sometimes it's not enough. Even though uh, it, it looks very dense in a lot of spaces, we're constantly looking for additional information. And for example, uh, I am uh, showing a map, uh, the left-hand side is uh, this this is a few years old. I'll explain why I keep going to this one. Um, on the left hand side is Mexico. The red dots are the WMO stations plotted. And at that time, there were about seven, 70 stations that came and went. Well, it wasn't adequate because, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, our colleagues at Climate Prediction Center were uh, under a separate agreement with Mexico, they were receiving on the order of uh, over 900 rain gauge stations. This looks like a lot of overkill, um, especially when you look at the left-hand map. You've got a nice number of stations to work with. Uh, there seems to be at least one in every state, et cetera. The only problem was the, the weather uh, stations that we got through the WMO were, uh, you know, incomplete a lot of times. Now, on the left-hand side is an analysis from early April in 2010. And this is an old one, but like like most of my stories, they're, they're pretty old. Um, it looks like they got rain just about everywhere, just looking at the left-hand map. Now, this is significant this time of year in Mexico because this is the start of the rainy season. And if you can imagine the central part, the south central part of Mexico is their summer corn belt. They wait for rain, uh, like a lot of uh, countries, including our own, they'll wait for rain before they plant it. And I saw this map and I was like, wow, they're gonna be able to plant early in Western parts of the corn belt. Well, I that didn't make sense to me. It just didn't look right. So I asked Climate Prediction Center, it's like, hey, you know, can you help me out with this? That's when they started sending me the Mexican gauge station. And you can see that the Mexican uh, gauge station is showing rain just along the Gulf Coast. That's what you would expect during a normal start to the rainy season. So I was looking at something that the data was telling me but my understanding of the climate made me skeptical. Okay, so that, that's another thing that, that we have to keep, take into consideration. It's like what, it's not only what you're looking at, but whether that makes physical sense. And to me, it didn't make physical sense. So I went elsewhere. And uh, ever since then, I've been looking at this for uh, guidance on how much rain they've gotten in Mexico. That's one example. Another example, and I'm, I'm using the same uh, you know, region, another product that we are, uh, you know, that we have access to from Climate Prediction Center is a product we call Seamorph. It's basically a morph, morph, morphing 
of all of their uh, satellite rainfall estimates. And I'll toggle back and forth and you can see that, uh, you know, looking at the WMO data, which works wonderfully in other parts of the world, but wasn't cutting it in Mexico, gave a better description, uh, you know, as well. So th this sort of highlights one of the, one of the, I guess, uh, activities that are ongoing uh, with our group. We look at the weather and, and climate data, we study it, uh, we look for comparable seasons, but we're always looking for more because we know that there are limitations, especially in the in-situ data. There's even limitations in satellite data. So we do a lot of number crunching. Um, we like to say that we get our hands dirty with the data. So we're not you know, we're not getting the these piped in from somebody. We're we're all looking at the maps. We're all uh, doing our own analyses, et cetera, just so that we can convince ourselves that what we're looking at is as accurate a depiction that's available for us. You know, not just for weekly weather and crop bulletin, but also you know for the WASD. And it's important to have a good record because we'll go back to years. If there's a year of bad data anywhere in the history that we're looking at, that means that we really can't use, uh, you know, that that bad period as an analog. It, you know, so if we see in reports, hey, this year in Argentina was just like 2017. If I don't have data for 2017, I really don't know what that means. You know, so it, it again, Having uh, uh, our own internal quality controlling of the data has given us, uh, you know, a very powerful database to work with. Now, over the years, uh, we've had other sources of data. Um, I showed you the in situ and the rainfall data. This is a product uh, called the Vegetative Health Index, and we actually worked with uh, Dr. Felix Kogan, uh, who basically developed this uh, product with his staff. This is a look at the satellite bands uh, combined for temperature and vegetation. Um, I'm using this year, uh, you know, the snapshot of the prairies as an example. Remember, I mentioned early on that we had to make some uh, corrections to the, uh, you know, to, to our yield estimates on the Canadian prairies for both spring wheat and canola. And this was one of the guiding factors. Uh, if you looked at just rainfall only, uh, you know, things, things looked a, a lot worse. But, you know, they didn't have an excessively hot, uh, you know, summer this year in parts of the prairies. It did get warm towards the end of the season. But during the critical months, it, it, it wasn't uh, comparable. It wasn't as bad as it was a couple of years ago when they had, you know, what I guess would be considered a once every 50 year drought. Uh, yields were abysmal pretty much across the board. So it wasn't that bad. So in if I had only had the WMO data to look at, I may have thought things were a little bit worse than they were as it was, you know, we were able to pinpoint uh, exactly where the reductions were. We could apply a crop mask and say, okay, it looked like this percentage of the canola was stressed versus this percentage of the spring wheat, et cetera. So this is another uh, tool in our, in our arsenal. And I have to give credit uh, to my colleagues, uh, Harlan Shannon and Eric Lubehues, and some of you uh, may know, uh, are also uh, you know, analysts working on the WASDI. They were really at the forefront of bringing this product into operational status. Um, I was, like always, you know, I, I was a skeptic about using satellite-derived uh, information. They they found a way to prove, uh, you know, prove the metal of this product. Um, so we really can't thank our partners at NOAA enough for allowing us to have this. I think that we were, um, I can't say for certain, but I think that we were one of the only 
groups, while we were the first group to ever reach out to them and say, hey, we're using this operationally. What can we do to make sure that uh, we keep getting this product is very important. Uh, you know, so, so again, you know, our partnership with NOAA has paid dividends. Um, and we also have partners with the countries. Uh, this is the uh, drought depiction from Canada. Uh, Canada has its own drought monitor, as does Mexico, and we work together to produce a monthly snapshot of North American drought, um, cleverly named the North American Drought Monitor, which, of which I'm an author. But it, again, I'll toggle back and forth, and you can see, if you look at Alberta and southern Manitoba, you see that this captures the dryness pretty well also. Um, and again, this is just more information that we can use to say, hey, look how bad the drought was in Alberta. Look how bad it wasn't in Saskatchewan, because when we start hearing, uh, you know, things about how there were some good yields uh, in Saskatchewan, maybe parts of western Manitoba, we can pinpoint that. And by applying crop mass, we can uh, do our best to quantify that as well. Now, I, I have to mention, uh, you know, some of the issues we have in getting data. Um, as I mentioned earlier in, you know, Mexico, um, I was not happy with the results of just do, using WMO data um, because, you know, they just had quality issues. We had the situation in, in uh, early 2022 after the invasion of Ukraine where we did lose data. Um, and then th this is a snapshot uh, of what we had before the invasion in Ukraine and what we had afterwards. The map on the right-hand side is from March of 2022. So, you know, the month following the invasion, that number has changed. We, we've, we've seen stations come and go. It made it very difficult to uh, you know, come up with an analysis for temperatures. Um, but again, uh, one of my colleagues, it was, it was Eric Lubehusen again, uh, worked very closely with our counterparts in Foreign Ag Service, who who were also getting information from um, you know other government agencies on data availability, and he was able to generate or develop proxy regional data that allowed him to move forward in his uh, crop monitoring and his uh, yield assessments. Uh, he, we, uh, we have done, uh, I want to say, a reasonably good job with our yield estimates in Ukraine based on Eric's and other people's efforts. Um, you know, everybody assumed that the, the worst was going to happen in Ukraine and in neighboring parts of Russia, they've actually had some reasonably good years because of the weather and because really they had no they had uh, no other option than to plant. Uh, you know, production is not what it was pre-invasion, but uh, you know we were able to use the information to show that what was planted was was doing pretty well. So again, that helped inform our decision. Uh, making on, you know, that part of the globe. And, um, you know, once again, it's this combination of having data, having knowledge of the climate, but really taking a look at things and asking yourself, does this really make sense? Uh, the vegetation, uh, the satellite imagery really came in hand in Ukraine, but the importance of the temperatures uh, were in this example, was, uh, you know, we need uh, information on temperatures to help model the, the crop progress for some of our analyses. So, you know, knowing how warm it was, uh, you know, we can track the crop growth just modeling growing degree days. So that was very important. And again, it, it just shows any given day, uh, you have to look at the data and, and look for problems and be ready to address them as best you can. Now, I want to uh, talk a little bit. I've talked about the data available. Um, we also have other information that we incorporate. One of them is the knowledge of the climate. Um, 
and what the possibilities are for uh, you know farming in some of these areas. And I'll start with Brazil, which is one of my areas. And this is a map showing the second corn crop production. And for those of you who aren't uh, you know following that part of the world, Brazil grows two corn crops. They grow a what you would deem a summer crop. And then I want to say about 20 years ago, they started growing a second crop because the rainy season was so long in Mato Grosso and other you know, parts of the uh, central interior that they found out that once the rainy season started, we can grow a soybean crop and then maybe we can get away with growing a corn crop, at least get something out of it. Well, over the years, they have been doing remarkable jobs with developing shorter uh, season varieties of soybeans to plant right when it starts raining. And then they've got, uh, you know, equally impressive corn seeds that they plant right as, as soon as the soybeans come out of the ground. So in, in basically that resulted in them having a larger second corn crop than they do, uh, you know, the first corn crop. Okay, now they grow uh, their uh, crops in basically two different types of climates. One is, you know, the subtropical rain, which is, um, you know, at the bottom of the blue line. That basically means it, it rains all year. They do get some rain. It does get cold. It, it can get frosty in parts of southern uh, Brazil, but they, they get rain all year. The tropical wet and dry season, it starts raining, rains like gangbusters, and then some years it's almost like you're turning off a faucet. So it, it, it is that tropical, you know, monsoon type climate where it's bone dry and hot and then it rains and then it turns bone dry and hot again. And the length of time that it rains really is what we're watching to see, you know, how good their soybean crop could be or their corn crop could be after the soybeans. Now, this is what the climate looks like just in terms of rainfall. That little, that red circle in the map in said is uh, Paraná. That's in that uh, mid-latitude uh, climate. And you see that they get rain just about all year. Not uh, as much, you know, it's not a straight line, but it, they do get some rain all year. Uh, Mato Grosso, uh, that blue line, the one that I was talking about, you know, doing just a, a phenomenal job growing corn and soybeans, you see that they their rainy season peaks in January and February, and then it tapers off. Now, the important thing uh, to note when, uh, you know, you're, you're monitoring how much corn Brazil is producing is when they plant their soybeans in Mato Grosso and and you know, that vicinity, because if they plant late, uh, sometimes during a La Nina year, we'll see them plant late. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. When they plant late, they harvest late soybeans. Uh, they can have a fantastic soybean crop, uh, it, even if they plant late. But then they have to get that corn crop in, and then they have to hope that it rains at least through pollination, uh, you know, whenever they plant it. Some years it does, some years it doesn't. You know, that's why it's, it, you, you really have to monitor the starting and the ending of the rainy season very carefully. Now, I took a, a couple of examples of, uh, you know, some of the analysis analyses that we did. And this is what a typical uh, rainfall trend going back to January looks like. This is about the time that, uh, well, maybe February, uh, late January, early February, would be the time when they would want to start planting corn. Now, um, you know, you're looking at a couple of years there. The uh, black line is what normally happens. 2022 is the red line. 2021 is the green line. Well, 2021 looks a lot worse than uh, 2022. But if you'll note 2022, even though uh, it rained, uh, you know, just nonstop, right around the end of March, it dried out drastically. Okay, so that was a big deal. 
because a lot of times in the past, if we were trying to make an assessment of, you know, that second corn crop, we would look at April and May rainfall. And we would say to ourselves, well, it, it, it was very dry in April and May. You know, it, it, it's probably going to be a bad crop. And now that it's a bigger crop, it, it's the majority of the crop, you know, we, we have to be really careful about making those assumptions. Now, what I did, uh, and again, this is one of my areas, uh, what I did was I you know, noted when they planted, uh, went, went through the crop reports, which is, which, that's another great source of information, going to the co countries themselves and tracking, you know, when they planted. And you can see that this year, they actually started planting in January and they were about halfway done by the first week of February. So a lot of the crop, uh, you know, and again, we're, you know, we're talking about relatively short varieties because they're, they're back to back with a short season soybean. They, they ended up with really good conditions through dent. And it was really only those later planted crops that, uh, you know, suffered from that early, uh, you know, early end to the rainy season. Now, um, you know, looking at the line at the top, Normally, uh, you know, it, it basically dried out, uh, you know, sometime during the first week of April. Had they had normal rains, they would have had another 127 millimeters, roughly five inches of rain. So the rainy season ended, uh, you know, prematurely, if you will. They, they uh, you know, missed out on five inches of rain had they gotten normal uh, rainfall. Well, but they planted early. So what do you do with that? Um, and what I uh, did was I looked at other years where that happened. And I showed that, you know, given the planting dates, some of the other years that dried out that were in our memory, you know, those are the things that we're thinking about. You always think about the last bad years, like, oh, it dried out in 2021. And, you know, we had this horrible crop. But what we had to do, uh, because we had the information, was we were able to go back and say, well, wait a second, they planted early. Okay, let's model the crop. Let's see how much of the crop got through, say, the, the, the blister stage, which is, which is one of the stages we look at. Um, you know, certainly dent, uh, you wouldn't expect there to be a lot of uh, impact, um, you know, after it dried out, but we were like, let, let's look at this year, you know, we, we, we're, we're, you know, let's not automatically lump this into what we think is a similar growing season. And one of the other things that we do, um, and I, I won't go into a lot of detail here, um, but just like everybody else, we try to model these. Uh, all of us have developed uh, regression modeling some of us have done a better job than others with the regression models. And again, I'll, I'll uh, give a, a nod to my uh, colleagues, Harlan and Eric, whom I mentioned earlier, and also, you know, Brian Morris, who has done a lot of uh, good work modeling rice and cotton using te these techniques. Um, what I was able to do was to take uh, soil moisture that I model using the WMO data that I talked about and the VHI at the critical growing stages. And as we were getting all of these, um, I don't know uh, what you would call them, getting a lot of bad news out of Brazil about how bad the crop is. And I, I presented this and I said, I'm not seeing it. I'm seeing that it, it, it probably wasn't a tremendous year but I'm not seeing that bad of a year. And I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you know, we came in with, uh, you know, when other people were like in the low fives, we uh, adopted, uh, I want to say a yield of around 5.8, 5.9, because we, the, the, the weather was just not that bad for a significant portion of the crop they ended up having uh, something closer to 6.4 because apparently there were, um, you know, more of the corn uh, escaped 
from the early end of the growing season than you know we we had anticipated, or at least they they were telling us. Um, that's the other thing. Uh, you know, if you get information out of the country saying things are bad, eh, you know, you want you want you want to verify, trust but verify. Uh, that doesn't. That was another uh, famous saying. That was from the eighties. If if you're old enough to remember that. Now, also included in knowledge of the climate is, I guess, knowledge of how uh, known climate phenomena affect the weather from any given year. Um, El Nino, La Nina, probably uh, the most well-known. This is a, a shot, um, and again, this is old, but this is probably one of the nicest graphs I, I have showing uh, what goes on during, uh, you know, the El Nino, La Nina cycle, um, you can see that, um, you know, they go from, well, I didn't want to do that. I'll leave it. I'll, I'll, I'll let bygones be gone. Um, but you could see, uh, here, I'll, I'll start it back up. You could see that they phased between warmer than normal sea surface temperatures in the Pacific and cooler than normal. That's a normal cycle. Okay, so it's not um, it's not unusual for there to be uh, an El Nino like like we're having this year. It's not that unusual to to be in a La Nina. It's just part of the cycle. Now, I will say that having multiple years of La Nina several times over the last twenty years was abnormal. Um, that's you know, there's a lot of theories behind why we're you know why that happened which I won't go into, you know, right now. Um, but again, you know, when people are following the climate, it's it's more than just how much rain do they get, how much, uh, you know, how hot does it get? Um, you know, it's like, what, what can impact the climate that sort of gets incorporated into what we would normally expect? Uh, you know, for example, Part of the part of the climate in the southeast United States is, uh, you know, when they have remnants of, of, a, of a tropical storm or hurricane bringing them rain. It happens a lot. It doesn't happen every year, but it happens most years where they'll at least get some tropical moisture. And that's part of their climate. You know, so if it doesn't happen, that that's also something that, um, you know, they have to factor in. One of the things that we have to factor in for uh, several parts of the world is that crop production is impacted by weather changes brought on by El Nino or La Nina. Now, um, and again, I'm just including this uh, for background. Uh, we've known for a long time, uh, you know, and this is this is uh, you know chart from uh, you know Climate Prediction Center. Uh, we knew about El Nino uh, based on, you know, the famous story of the Peruvian fisherman who named it El Nino, but also Sir Gilbert Walker, a climatologist, noticed that uh, there was a correlation between, you know, what pressure tendencies in other parts of the Pacific based on what the temperatures were. So we've known for a long time that, uh, you know, El Nino La Nina impacts weather in other parts of the world. Now, this is uh, a chart, <coughs> excuse me, it was derived from uh, seminal research on uh, the phenomenon uh, done by uh, Climate Prediction Center and the International Research Institute for uh, Climate and Economics. This is uh, a, a, a standard chart, you know, if you will, showing what the expectations are globally for La Nina. And it, it, if you look uh, closely on the lower right-hand side, you see dryness in Argentina. We saw that. We saw uh, you know, really bad droughts uh, off and on the last couple of years in Argentina. You see wet weather in, um, you know, tendency for wet weather in Australia and, uh, you know, parts of Africa. We saw that. We saw that. As a matter of fact, uh, Australia had three bumper wheat production yields. Um, the one area that uh, last year didn't uh, act like a La Nina was in uh, California in the Southwest. Remember, we had that flooding. That that was unexpected. Um, head of Climate Prediction Center will tell anybody that will listen that that was a weird year. So 
that's an example of, you know, we sort we see the trends, but it doesn't happen every year. Not every year that there is a, a, an El Nino, uh, you know, we don't see drought in South Africa or Australia. I mean, that it happens a lot, but, um, you know, it doesn't happen every year. So what the analysts who have, have areas impacted by that, they familiarize themselves with what to watch for. And I'll show an example. This is this is just very simplistic, um, obviously, but when people will say, oh, there's a, you know, there's an, a La Nina in uh, Argentina, there's going to be a drought. Well, that does happen a lot, but not always. You see, uh, you know, the uh, 2000, it looks like 16, they had a near record crop. Um, now that was following two years of El Nino, which they they do tend to have better crops. But again, it, it's you 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 can be you can be lulled into a, a sense of something is going to happen just because we have an El Nino or a La Nina. A lot of times uh, they're right, but sometimes you know we we see things that uh, you know don't really follow the rule. Uh, South Africa corn, which I mentioned, they've had a lot of droughts during El Nino's. But uh, if you look at 2004, they had a record yield, uh, at, at, you know, in an El Nino. It happens. And I, I you know, I, I have joked with people in the past, uh, you know, when they, they say that I'm being conservative. I go, ah, you know, and, and I, I point these years. I also point to uh, some of the years where I was the Australia wheat analyst. I mean, they've had uh, they've had some uh, you know pretty miserable droughts based on El Nino, but then they'll get rain, and you see that uh, you know we're we're lower this year in anticipation of them having you know not a fourth record year of production. We're not taking El Nino into account. We're basically saying, hey, things are going to probably at least be back to normal. We're still monitoring on a weekly basis, you know, what's going on in Australia. Um, but again, we follow these trends. Now, unfortunately, some countries that you really want to see a strong trend in, there's, there's really not a lot there. Now, this is uh, Brazil soybeans. This is taken from USDA's database. And uh, try try as I might, um, you know, I you I don't see anything where you can just stick a pin in it and say, hey, they're going to have a drought this year. Hey, they're going to have, um, you know, bumper crop this year. Now, I, I'll point out, though, one of the uh, problems with covering Brazil, and I sort of hinted on this, uh, you know, a few slides ago. They grow in uh, separate climates. They've been very aggressive in altering their cropping patterns to take advantage of the tropical rains they get in Mato Grosso, you know, Bahia, you know, some of those other states where they're expanding, uh, you know, planting. So the rules are, are, are pretty much changing for them. And also the most drought prone areas in the South are, uh, you know, remember I talked about those mid-latitude uh, growing areas. Those are the most drought-prone areas, um, you know, just because of, uh, you know, their, their, their tendency to dry out during the summer months and get hot. But, uh, you know, less of the crop is grown there. So if you had a, if you had a drought in Rio Grande de Sul 20 years ago, and you had the same magnitude drought this year, there wouldn't be that as big an impact on corn or soybean production. So again, um, you know, we're taking our knowledge of the climate, our knowledge of the weather, our knowledge of what weather products best inform uh, yields, uh, you know, from, from the modeling that, that, you know, my colleagues and I do. And then we're getting information out of the countries, like when did they plant? Uh, are there, you know, what type of varieties are are they are they growing this year? That that does that happens in some areas. You know, how much canola did they grow versus spring wheat in Canada? You know, things like that. That helps us to to gauge 
uh, you know, if if we do see a problem, if we know how much has grown there, I mean, obviously that that that's a big help. So the weather intelligence, the intelligence we get uh, from the countries and our and our colleagues from um, FAS and ERS, they help us, you know, present a, a, a picture to the analysts, you know, in the run up to, uh, you know, we call it the lockup in, in our lockup meetings. We can take this information and go to the oil seed analyst and we can go to the, you know, the, uh, the, the you know, food and, and the feed grains analysts and just say, here's what we're seeing. So again, it, it, it's, it's a big picture. And um, uh, I, if you're impressed by this, you have the uh, old Soviet Union of the 1970s to thank for it. Now, this is what we're looking for in an El Nino. Okay, it, as you've read, uh, you know, we're expecting, uh, in fact, we're in a, what looks to be a fairly strong El Nino. Uh, we're expecting a rebound in uh, Argentina. Haven't quite seen it yet. We're seeing some rain there, but it's a little slow to start in the West. Um, you know, it remains to be seen uh, how Australia finishes and how, um, uh, you know, South Africa goes. Uh, Equatorial Africa, we were expecting dryness, really didn't see a lot of it. Uh, we saw some and, uh, you know, in our neck of the woods, uh, if this were a typical El Nino, we would be uh, encouraged that the southern tier and, uh, you know, including the uh, southern plains, which has been marred by drought, you know, the last few seasons, to get some good winter rainfall. Okay, so we're crossing our fingers. But again, as I pointed out, it's it's not always a done deal. We'll just have to, you know, keep an eye on it, even though, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of we're sort of crossing our fingers, uh, you know, that we can uh, take a little bigger bite out of the drought in the United States this year. Now, that's all I have. Um, I, I just my email is up there. And, you know, you can reach out to the uh, conference organizers. But I just wanted to give a plug for a couple of our other products. This is the weekly weather and crop bulletin. And I mentioned that. Um, we, uh, you may have heard, uh, I, unfortunately, I, I couldn't uh, sit in on the opening remarks, but you may have heard that we just celebrated the 50th year of the WASDE. Um, and I'll I'll do one better. Uh, we've been working on the weekly weather and crop bulletin since, uh, well, not we, me, but the Weather and Crop Bulletin has existed in one form or the other since 1872. And the version that we have now has been around for about 100 years. Okay. And this is, uh, you know, this is a product that we're very proud of. And we also have a, a daily work, you know, during the work week, uh, you know, a daily snapshot of what the weather's like and how that may impact uh, crops, mostly in the near term, but we also have an outlook where, you know, we, we would talk a little bit long, maybe what's going to happen out to, you know, maybe the, ne the next week. So again, there's a lot of information that we provide uh, to the public on our website, but I, I think the, the heart of the uh, organization is working towards uh, you know, working on the WASDE. And I always like to end with with one more thing. I know I've been talking forever, but when you get the weather analyses, uh, you know, from, from our staff, uh, you know, we, we uh, sign the same disclaimers that everybody else who works on these economic reports are, do. Uh, these are major, uh, you know, economic indicators. We work with market sensitive information. We sign the agreements too. So, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to go out and, you know, give a speech on how El Nino is going to, going to, you know, wreck the, the wheat crop somewhere. We don't do that. Okay. So, you know, the, the meteorologists working for the world board basically work for the public. Uh, just just like all of the all of my other colleagues, you know, economists and, you know, other staff. So uh, we're we're there for you. Um, and I would be willing to answer any questions if I haven't bored you enough. Uh, 
if you want to go take a nap after hearing me talk, you can email me later. So, um, but I'm going to finish uh, and I'm going to thank you very much again for the opportunity to uh, speak today. We might have maybe a minute or two just to see if anyone has any questions. It looks like we've got one question here. <laughs> okay. I I see the question. Uh, can you talk about the decision to lower corn yield in July 2023? No. That <laughs> I I had uh, no input into that decision. Um I think that uh, our our uh, our colleagues at NAS uh, might be able to answer that, um, you know, because they're the ones doing the surveys and, uh, you know, getting the information from the ground. So I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, sorry, Mark. <laughs> Any other question? Maybe just one last one. Well, I I noticed that uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Brad uh, Rippy and Eric Lubhusen, whom I I mentioned, um, I would ask them, you know, if they had any comments they wanted to make, um, you know, about their about their own, uh, you know, personal work at the World Board. Mm -hmm. Brad, Eric. Do you have any comments that you wanted to make, any in input? Mark, this is Brad. I, I think you covered it all. I mean, there's no questions I, I really to speak of, so I think that that's pretty telling. There is a new question, though, from Brad Fuller. I don't know if you see that, Mark. Yeah, hey, Brad. Uh, how's it going? Um, Brad Fuller. I got a, Mark got a question from Mark, and then Brad introduced a question from Brad. Um, Right now, Mata Grosso is, um, they're, they're holding their own bread. I think, uh, if I remember correctly, they had planted about 40% of their soybeans. As of a few days ago, uh, they've been getting spotty showers. Uh, they'd like to see more consistent rain, and they'd like to see it be cooler. So, uh, because they, this past week, they just had some spotty showers. Um, I would say that the moisture right now is is um, sort. I don't want to say disappointingly low because it is early in the rainy season. But uh, you know they're they're really wanting some more rain now to ensure uniform germination of the soybeans. Uh, but it is a good it is a good sign that they're planting early. Uh, they're not planting as fast as they did last year, but they're ahead of the five year average. Okay, the Indian Robbie crop. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, my colleague Brian isn't there. I I know that um, there there had been some initial concern about uh, about the rice crop, but then they then they received additional rainfall. Uh, right now, the monsoon has basically pulled out. Um, it, it remains to be seen how what the irrigation situation is uh, for them, uh, you know, because if 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 I, I if I'm not mistaken, uh, they they rely a lot on tube wells in India, so uh, fuel availability is also a driver. Um, now, one of the things uh, you know we had expected a lot worse with the El Nino over South and Southeast Asia, and we didn't see it. Um, so 
if there's a second year of El Nino, maybe, uh, you know, maybe we'll have more to talk about. All right, and I think that will be our last question. Um, so um, everyone, we do have the links for the uh, next two breakout sessions that are scheduled to start at 2.05. Um, and so thank you all. Thanks everybody.